We live in a very uncertain world. And for a lot of you, especially here in America, we're staring down the barrel of potentially some very scary times. And it is moments like this that is of seminal, critical importance to remember who we are, why we're here, and what our purpose is. It's key to remember those guiding principles, that bedrock foundation for everything that we are as a wrestling fan society. Oh yes, it is times like these that we have to cling to that the most because that's one that faith ultimately is rewarded the most. And with that, I will bring to you a reading from the Book of Hunter, one of the three books of God. No matter what, there are those who don't believe. Just because on Raw, him they did not see. But Seth Rollins' career is about to reach its eve at the hands of God Almighty at WrestleMania 33. Ugh. Now I have no time for your New Japan loving internet hate. For his yearly divine rapture, I just cannot wait. Raw's saving grace from his schnoz will blow. In the meantime, let's review another crappy WWE show. And may this review be blessed on everything that is the Hunter, the Hearst, and the Helmsley. Amen. Ugh. Now let's face it, the vast majority of you watching this review did not like this week's show. Nor did I. Let's not pussyfoot through the tulips. It's time to smell the roses. We know this crap sucked, so why hide from it? Why not own it and accept it and talk about it? So the theme of this week's Raw review is going to be about everything that, in my opinion, was wrong with this week's Raw episode. This could be a long one. So buckle your safety belts, people, because we're about to dive all in on it. I'm sure there are quite a number of you that clicked on this Raw review expecting me to come on here and lampoon the WWE and Vince K. McMahon for having the gall, the gumption, the cojones, uh, the grapefruits to pay tribute to Martin Luther King Jr. when so many things that their company have done over the years have run counterculture to the principles that Martin Luther King Jr. espoused when he wasn't face down in somebody that wasn't his wife. Uh, but I'm not going to do that. Because well, I've done that enough over the years, let's be honest. Enough other people have talked about it. I look at it this way. We live in a very Trumpian world now, where there are a lot of contradictions, double standards, hypocrisies, and ironies. And I felt it was more appropriate, based off of the current climate in this country at least, to approach it from that direction. So apparently Vince McMahon says that Martin Luther King Jr. is one of his heroes. There's a part of me that wonders if he's one of his heroes because Dr. King is dead. I'll throw that out there. But more importantly, you know, when you talk about social awareness, an awareness of self, an awareness of the environment that you're in. I find it incredibly ironic that the WWE, with their Martin Luther King show, as you'll call it every year, decided to have it in one of the three states that still celebrates Robert E. Lee's birthday as part of Martin Luther King Jr. Day. The WWE decided for a show where they're going to run a Martin Luther King Jr. tribute video that it was a good idea to have Raw in Little Rock, Arkansas. Arkansas, one of the three backwoods southern fuck states that views Robert Lee as enough of a hero to not only give him his own day, like even here in Virginia, the ridiculousness of giving him his own day, but they give him a day to share with Martin Luther King Jr. A traitor, a slaveholder, who created, who committed, excuse me, all types of atrocities 
against slaves, you know, sewing uh, returned slaves' wounds with brine. This is the environment of which you chose to celebrate Dr. King's legacy. Is in a state where they celebrate a traitorous slaveholder who ultimately served a traitorous nation in the Confederate States of America to protect the institution of slavery. I think that says all I need to say about the lack of awareness and the social stupidity of the WWE. Now, admittedly, the MLK Jr. tribute video was already getting me in a sour mood because I know what it reeks of from the WWE, and it's a pathetic play. But you dive right in, and I'm already agitated and aggravated. It's Roman Reigns, it's Paul Heyman, it's Braun Strowman, it's this, it's that, it's Kevin Owens, it's Chris Jericho, it's Seth Rollins, it's Sami Zayn, it's all these fucking people. This opening segment was one gigantic clusterfuck designed ultimately to put over and set up a six-man tag for the end of the night that a half million of your viewers that watched the opening segment weren't going to bother to stick around and see three hours from now. And all the while, ultimately, most importantly, with the WWE, nobody gets over. And in the case of Roman Reigns is in particular, nobody gets over the right way. Now, how could you have done this and made it actually work and had it be a coherent, compelling opening segment? You have Roman Reigns come out, and instead of pretending like the U.S. title doesn't matter to him or that the U.S. title doesn't even exist, he's so fucking pissed that the show's not going to continue until he gets a match against Chris Jericho right here, right now, tonight. He's going to win that belt and back, and then he's going to go on to the Royal Rumble, he's going to win the Universal Championship, and he's going to main event and headline WrestleMania, and there's nobody in the fucking company that can stop him. Out comes now Paul Heyman, who sits there and reminds him that the Beast Incarnate, the Conqueror, Brock Lesnar, will take Roman Reigns once again to Suplex City, bitch, at WrestleMania in the main event. To where, as Paul Heyman is saying this and walking down the ring, Roman Reigns turns to him and very quickly tells Paul Heyman to shut the fuck up. If he takes one step in this ring, he's going to spear his fucking head off. And if that block-headed bitch Brock has a problem with it, well then, by God, he could come do something about it right now because he knows he's fucking back there. Heyman takes a step in the ring. Roman delivers. He fucking spears the dude. Out comes fucking Brock Lesnar. And then him and Lesnar stare down. And him and Lesnar fucking get into it. And then here comes Braun Strowman because he's not going to miss this opportunity. And then here comes Seth Rollins to make the save. And then here comes Kevin Owens and Chris Jericho standing at the top of the ramp laughing smiling like the Cheshire Cat because they've got both of the titles. And then now you can bring out a Stephanie or a Foley or it doesn't fucking matter. And you can set up a match between freaking Roman Reigns and Chris Jericho one-on-one, -on -one, no disqualification for the United States Championship at the end of the night. And what you've managed to accomplish to do is do something somewhat compelling and interesting with Roman Reigns to make him somewhat seem like the badass, not-give-a-shit dude where he's not a good guy, he's not a bad guy, he is the guy. Well, this is a way for him to act not like a good guy, not like a bad guy, but the guy, and actually perhaps maybe start to get people to not hate his fucking guts as much. And all the while, you're still setting up to a match later on in the night, but at least in this particular case, you're acknowledging the U.S. title like it exists, like it fucking matters, because at the end of the day, when you have... Roman Reigns do what Roman Reigns did here, and you have this whole opening segment ultimately be the clusterfuck shit that it was... All you do is make the U.S. title completely irrelevant. No matter what anybody says, belts should be star-making devices. If nothing else, they should be devices to make money. And as fans, if the guy who just lost the belt doesn't give a shit about it, why should we give a shit about the guy who holds the title or the title at all, period? It's just the stupidity of the WWE encapsulated in one segment, and oh, by the way, we still had two hours and 45 minutes plus of this crap left to go. See, what Daddy don't understand is, Roman don't care about the U.S. title because he got bigger and better things on his agenda. 
like going on to the Royal Rumble and winning the WWE Universal Championship, taking that shit away from that maple syrup sucking mother canucker Kevin Owens with his stupid sideways stretch marks. Nobody likes your fat ass anyways. Roman Reigns is the future, and you bitches better recognize, and he will go on to walk in the Universal Champion at WrestleMania, and he will leave with the WWE Universal Championship at WrestleMania, and there's nothing that you can do about it, there's nothing that stupid Braun Strowman can do about it, and there most certainly as hell is nothing Piglet's gonna do about it. I wish a bitch would. Roman Reigns is going to rule supreme on Sunday, January 29th. Hell yeah, bitches. Roman, love yous. Love you, Roman. Roman, I'm Nike. Call me. DM me. Instagram me. Something. Roman, love you. I'm Nike. The next winner of the Royal Rumbles. Braun Strowman, and if someone has a problem with that, I will yoke that bitch up, and if Roman Reigns has a problem with that, Braun Strowman will see you at Wrestlemania, bitch, and if any of you do not like that, I will yoke you up too. Oh, and speaking of the WWE, it just wouldn't be Vince McMahon's show if he didn't do something to freaking just shit all over our intelligence. So a week ago, Enzo Amore needs a hover round. He could barely move. And now this week, he can walk around. He can move around just fine. And in fact, he's suitable enough condition to wrestle in a tag match. Oh, praise the Lord. A freaking miracle happened. Seriously. You know, you, you do something like that, there has to be some type of payoff to that story of the dude being in the hover round. Otherwise, why would you put him in the goddamn scooter the hover round to begin with? And then furthermore, on top of that, if that didn't piss me off enough, seeing what they've saddled Rusev with, we're not even so much even focused on Lana anymore. We're focused on Jinder Mahal and how the hell he's passed any recent wellness tests. Rusev, a legit talent. A dude with personality undercover. And we waste him in this crap where we're more focused on what's going into Jinder Mahal's ass to beef up his biceps than we are a dude that should be hanging around the main event scene of WWE. Rusev fucking rules. And everybody needs to come to this realization more and more every week. Especially the goddamn company that he works for. Yes, the IWC has been overtaken by the nerds and the lovers of lame. <laughs> yes. But I have been sent by the man of three books <laughs> to save. The wrestling game. <laughs> so while you sit there and worship your monkeys of spots, just keep me in your innermost thoughts. For very soon, at the Royal Rumble Review, you will ask yourself, what, if anything, can we do <laughs> to save us all from the crap of McMahon? Enter me, the man with the plan, the shattered schleg. Daddy, yes, yes, yes. Now, granted, as in society, sometimes things change. And just because the way they were done once doesn't mean they're the way they should be done now. However, on the flip side of that, sometimes things used to be done a certain way and were successful for a reason. And not doing them now 
is insanity because there's no good reason to do it. I look at this tag title match. Sheamus and Cesaro are supposed to be the babyface champions. The club, the bald-headed jobbers are supposed to be the heels, the villains. You're supposed to not like them in theory, and you're supposed to like Sheamus and Cesaro, but we already know how ridiculous all of this is anyways. But we get to this match, and it's starting to build to some momentum, perhaps. But we get to the finish, and we do an ass-backwards dusty finish. The faces are getting disqualified because they knocked out the ref. Therefore, the heels are the ones that are getting screwed. Therefore, the heels win, but the baby faces still retain the title. And oh my god, my head is fucking spinning. Who writes this shit? Who books this shit? Anybody? How the fuck did somebody sit in a creative meeting and think that this was going to be a good idea? Let's throw out this fucking tag team title match buried in the middle of the fucking show and then do a baby face finish where the so-called villains are the ones getting screwed over. Unless you're doing the double turn, a double switch of the teams, which again would make no fucking sense and nor could you properly execute it, this finish was just absolutely astoundingly stupid. What the fuck? the heels win via count out. Do something, anything other than what you fucking did, you morons. And of course, during the show, I had a feeling what was up because at the very beginning, the first thing you saw with Raw, and it really just set the mood for me the whole night, and then you follow that up immediately with the MLK Jr. tribute video, was this graphic saying rest in peace to Superfly Jimmy Snuka. I already talked about this in a video where he deserves the Chris Benoit treatment, in my opinion, and frankly, I think he does. I think it's merited, and I think it's deserved. And to the knuckleheads that want to sit there and defend Snuka and defend the WWE, give me a fucking break. Your arguments are weak, bad, flawed, and borderline ridiculously stupid. The whole thing of... Well, the courts ultimately didn't convict him, so that means he's innocent. Number one, we know that's bullshit. Number two, he wasn't allowed to walk free because the evidence wasn't there. What don't you comprehend about this? He was allowed to skate off from this crap after over three decades of it being pushed to the back burner to the side, in large part because of his deteriorating mental and physical conditions. And why would a court system go through the process of spending money to convict a guy where they might not even be able to throw him in prison anyways because by the time he would get sentenced, he'd possibly be dead. And lo and behold, that's exactly where the hell we're at now in January 2017. Snook is dead. And to sit there and say, well, he wasn't convicted in court. But so many of us, like even when I talked about to hell with Chris Benoit, at the end of the day, no matter what anybody wants to believe, what happened that weekend in Atlanta... The simple fact of the matter is, Chris Benoit was never arrested for those crimes. He was never charged. He was never convicted by a jury of his peers. He was never sentenced by the court. So at the end of the day, Chris Benoit is believed to have killed two people. And yes, I know I said way back in that video, that was one thing if he killed his wife. Uh, but it went to a whole different level when he killed his son, too. And I still stand by that statement because it's true. But at the end of the day, if he had killed his wife, he still deserved to be blacklisted, just like fucking Snooka deserves to be blacklisted now. Instead of saying, rest in peace, Superfly Jimmy Snooka, how about we say, rest in peace, Nancy Argentino? And it pisses me off that that's going to be the ultimate legacy that I remember for somebody who was one of my favorites as a damn kid. Of course, as a kid, we didn't have the internet, so I didn't know the story of what happened in the hotel room in 1983. A serial abuser went too far, and his girlfriend, while he was married, mind you, is fucking dead. But this is the guy that the company chooses to run a graphic for, saying rest in peace. This is a guy, mind you, that they sit there and run a sleazy feeling tribute video for, but if you ask Linda McMahon during the middle of a Senate campaign if she knew who Lance Cade was, she sits there and tells you, I have no idea really who he was. I only bumped into him maybe twice and, you know, wasn't really involved with him. Have no knowledge of who he really was. Fuck Superfly Jimmy Snooker. May he rot in hell. You know, goddamn good and well, 
what he fucking did. If you actually bother to look at the evidence, it is pretty overwhelming. It is not circumstantial. Your faces are circumstantial. That evidence was very real. Especially if you want to sit there and say the evidence was real for you to believe what you believe about Chris Benoit. I believe it too. That evidence is pretty overwhelming, as it is with superflies. If you sit there and say, well, he said he didn't, fucking changed his story so many times over the last three decades of his life, he doesn't even know what the fucking truth is anymore. Shame on WWE for honoring that piece of shit. Now, it's one thing to me with this women's division in WWE that there are a lot of bow-wows there. There's not a lot of, oh my god, look at her, look how beautiful she is, how gorgeous she is, how badly I want to get with her. Now, I'm not saying everybody needs to be a perfect 10, but my god, this is the best we can do. But more importantly, when I hear Charlotte talk and I hear Bailey talk, I sit there and ask, is this the best we can do? Charlotte is just fucking god-awful. And I'm tired of people kissing her cock because she's Ric Flair's son daughter, okay? She fucking sucks. She's terrible. And listening to her talk on the mic is like having to listen to nails on a chalkboard. And the whole shit they were doing, trying to mock Bailey, this is not the type of crap that gets heat on Charlotte or gets a lot of sympathy for Bailey. It's just dumb and it's just fucking stupid. And if this is the best you could do, shame on you. Like what you did with Nia, Nia Jax and Sasha, where they were showing Sasha running the ropes before Raw, and Nia Jax came in and obliterated her and her fucking knee. That was really good. That felt different. It was one of the highlights of this goddamn show. But somebody decided it was a good idea to let Charlotte and Bailey talk. Oh, my Christ. You know, it's one thing that Bailey's Hug It Out act comes across as more millennial bullshit, and if anything, makes her a heel in my eyes, not a face. Can't we all just get along and love each other so much? But what the hell are we teaching these people at the Performance Center? What the hell are they learning at NXT? The ability to act, the ability to talk, and delivery most certainly aren't being taught down in Florida. Bailey fucking sucks on the mic. I can't believe people have kissed her ass so fucking much. Maybe you like her in the ring. And granted, a lot of you fucking do, because that's all you fucking care about anymore. And that's part of the reason why wrestling is the goddamn shape it's in. Because it came about the flips and the kicks and everything else that doesn't really truly draw the most money or set up to the matches to help draw the most possible money in professional wrestling. But Charlotte's terrible. And this company treats her like she's a goddess. And now you got Bailey, and you're potentially going to have her get involved with Stephanie McMahon. Ah, oh, fucking Christ Almighty! If this is what the Divas Revolution was ultimately going to produce, then I'd almost rather go back to the two-minute piss break matches we used to get, because this shit is longer, and as a result, it's just more brutal to sit through. Like some of you might say about this type of reviews. Marcus Smart here, and I gotta tell you, the Schleg Daddy just continues to astound me with his level of stupidity. Of course, the same creep that probably beats off still to this day to Jazz and Awesome Kong would have a problem with two beautiful young women like Charlotte and Bailey showing you what great women's professional wrestling is all about. Charlotte isn't great. She's wrestling royalty. Bailey can't talk. I know the Schleg Daddy is one to talk. Charlotte and Bailey are awesome. And that's the truth, and you all know it. They're two of the 101 things better than OTRS Central, but of course, that's not an all-inclusive list. That was just 101 things because there was so much more. Charlotte versus Bailey at the Royal Rumble is going to be awesome. And if you throw Sasha Banks in the mix, yeah, I tell you what you got to do. You know what's going to happen. They're going to steal the show at WrestleMania. We need another women's triple threat match for the championship. 
And by God, it should main event and close WrestleMania. That's how good Charlotte and Bailey are. And Sasha Banks, too. I love them. I love them. It's not about looks. It's not about being bubbly. It's about the nuts and bolts of ladies grabbing each other and wrestling in the ring. And that's what it should be about. Professional wrestling. The way professional wrestling should be. From some of the best female motherfucking professional wrestlers in the world. Another thing that bothered me about this show was that they devoted three matches, count them, three matches to the cruiserweights. And no, this is not a bash piece on um, giving the cruiserweights time on Raw, da 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 da. We've been down that road before. I enjoy seeing Jack Gallagher. I enjoy seeing Neville. I enjoy seeing the Brian Kendrick. So even though you think I only like the big dudes, those are three cruiserweights I just named that happen to entertain me, that I happen to enjoy, I happen to like their work. Fair? What I don't get, though, is devoting close to 45 minutes of combined television time when you splice in commercials to a division whose primary purpose on this show is to promote a 45-minute show on the WWE Network that far fewer members of your viewing audience are actually going to watch. That makes no sense. You're taking equal time, 45 minutes, on Raw, premium primetime Monday night television, to promote something that gets far less viewership on the WWE Network. 45 minutes of advertising for a 45-minute show. You're not exactly getting the most efficient bang for your buck. And what happens, too, is you get too many cruiserweight matches, and you do them in a way where people really don't care about them that much. They just kind of get lost in the schmas, and they don't stand out, and they're not different, and they're not unique. They're just bad. And that's what this cruiserweight division is because of the WWE. Bad. Period. And you just devoted 45 minutes of your fucking primetime Monday night television to promote a bad 45-minute WWE Network show. The fuck are the priorities with this stupid-ass company? Three cruiserweight matches is too much? I, you know, I can't even take this guy seriously anymore. Something has to be done. Something. I'm ticked off, and I'm not going to take it anymore. How dare you speak ill of Charlotte and Bailey? How dare you speak ill of the cruiserweights? They are the future of Monday Night Raw. And frankly, they are the future of the WWE. I know some of you, most of you, have got to be thinking, well, you can't have a problem with Kurt Angle being the headliner for the 2017 WWE Hall of Fame class, can you? Can you? And no, I don't. I'm happy about it. I think it's cool. I really do. I look at the Kurt Angle video package and it just reminded me of how good wrestling used to be and what it could be and what it should be. And to remember back on a talent like Kurt Angle and all the great stuff he did in WWF slash WWE. Attitude Era, one of the top guys. Ruthless Aggression Era, one of the top guys. Went to TNA, and he was a pillar of bedrock and a quality star for that company for a number of years, even though it doesn't get talked about a lot. And all of that. You know, Kurt Angle is one of the greatest of all time. I mean, the dude was legit, and everybody knew he was legit. He worked legit. He acted legit. He talked legit. He walked legit. He was just a badass dude and an incredibly entertaining freaking performer. And it kills me that we can't have one talent like Kurt Angle in today's business. Because I don't care what promotion you're freaking talking about. None of these young bucks, none of these guys, the bucks have sucked, but in just in general, none of the young studs at the top of any company, whether it's WWE, New Japan, ROH, Lucha Underground, whoever the fuck, in Impact Wrestling, who it doesn't matter. None of them smells Kurt Angle's butt cheese. None of them holds a candle to him. And it's striking when you look back at Kurt Angle and all the greatness that he had, and also sad when you look at the current state of affairs in the wrestling business. But what really bothers me about this is not just that fact, that it reminds me of how good wrestling used to be and what it isn't now. 
It's the fact that the internet has spoiled so many things when it comes to professional wrestling. We find out spoilers, whether we want to or not, via the dirt sheets, the chop shop dirt sheets, social media, what have you. We find out about a lot of the backstage inner workings and so on and so forth. There are very few things that myself as a wrestling fan can actually look forward to actually being a fan for, actually getting excited about, a chance to actually mark out. And now the WWE, by proactively choosing to leak who they're announcing for the Hall of Fame class, has robbed me of one of the last few surprise joys that I had. When it came time for that Road to Rumble, to Road to WrestleMania, one of the things I could look forward to every week on Raw was finding out if they're going to announce somebody for the Hall of Fame, and if they did, who it was going to be. It was great to have that element of anticipation, that element of surprise. And of course, the WWE took that fucking away from me too! Do you really think that that many more people are going to tune in to watch your show, to watch a freaking video package that you release ahead of time on YouTube and your website any fucking ways? This is one of these instances that I'm sick and fucking tired of the wrestling business cutting its feet out from under it. You've taken one of the last remaining vestiges of pure martyrdom that I had and ruined it! And in the immortal words of the fans, whenever Kurt Angle would come down the ramp, WWE for that, you suck! You suck! By the time we finally mercifully got to the six-man tag main event, I had long since mentally uh, quit on this show. I had emotionally divested from this. And it doesn't matter that Braun Strowman went over and squashed that little fucking worthless piece of crap, Sami Zayn. And frankly, it doesn't even matter that they finally did something to make Kevin Owens seem somewhat legitimate. Because a lot of people fear that they were only doing that to make Roman Reigns look better once Roman Reigns actually goes over him at the Royal Rumble. It's just too little, too fucking late. Again, if you're going to expect us to watch three hours... You got to give us something better. We got all types of garbage. The opening segment was hot shit. Absolute hot shit. In fact, some of the other filler crap that was so bad on this show that I could talk about, I'm not even bothering to talk about because I just don't care to. Contrary to popular opinion, I don't want to come on here and do a review and find myself ranting and raving about the product. But hence, that is the position I am put in by WWE as I choose to still try to give some type of chance to this company and ultimately watch the product, which even though a lot of you won't admit it, a lot of you do too. I feel like I have no choice. What other option is there? You can't really tell me this is good. Can you? Can you really point to this show and say that it made you tangibly, markedly more interested in the Royal Rumble Sunday, January 29th than you were before Raw. If anything, it made me less interested, not more interested. I just hope the Royal Rumble gives me something to latch onto. Something, because I need it.